Hey guys, for the next few days I'm going to finish all the short stories found in this collection because this is used for a lot of schools. So if you want to be updated on which ones I read, I'll, you know, subscribe below, that would be great. Like this video, comment whichever one you want first or second. Um, but until then, I'll just do it in chronological order. Okay, so other than the ones that I haven't done already that you can find on my channel, I'm going to start with At Home, At Home by Anton Chekhov. Alright, without further ado, let's dive in. At home. Someone came from the Gajoyevs to fetch some book or other. But I said you went in. The postman got the newspaper in two letters. By the way, Yevgeny Petrovic might ask you to turn your attention to Sorozer. Today and the day before yesterday, I noticed he was smoking. When I started appealing to his conscience, he blocked up his ears as usual and broke into a loud song to drown out my voice. Yevgeny Petrovic Bukovsky, the public prosecutor of the district court, who had just returned from a session and was taking off his gloves in his study, looked at the governess reporting to him and laughed. <laughs> Suryazar's smoking, he shrugged his shoulders. I can't just imagine that little shrimp with a cigarette. How old is he? Seven. It may not seem serious to you, but smoking at his age constitutes a harmful and bad habit and bad habits should be eradicated at the very outset. Perfectly true. And where does he get the tobacco from? From inside your deck. Really? In that case, send him to me. After the governess had gone, Bukovsky sat down in the armchair in front of his desk, closed his eyes, and began thinking. In his imagination, he for some reason drew his serioza with a huge, great, long cigarette in clouds of tobacco smoke, and this caricature made him smile. At the same time, the serious, concerned face of the governess evoked in him memories of the time long past and half forgotten when smoking at school and in the nursery had inspired in pedagogues and parents a strange, not entirely comprehensible horror. It really had been a horror. Lads were flogged pitilessly. They were expelled from school. Their lives were ruined. Although not one of the pedagogues or fathers knew where precisely the harm and criminality of smoking lay. Even very intelligent people had no difficulty waging war on a vice they did not understand. Yevgeny Petrovic recalled his headmaster, a highly educated and genial old man, who was so worried whenever he caught a boy from the school with a cigarette that he turned pale, immediately convened an emergency meeting of the pedagogical council and condemned the guilty party to expulsion. Such, no doubt, is the law of communal life. The more incomprehensible the evil, the more bitter and crude is the fight against it. The prosecutor recalled two or three of those who had been expelled in their subsequent lives, and could not help thinking that the punishment very often does much greater evil than the crime itself. A living organism has the capacity to adapt quickly, to become accustomed and acclimatized to absolutely any atmosphere. Otherwise a man would have to sense at every moment what an unreasonable substratum there not infrequently was to his reasonable activity, and how little entirely meaningful truth and certainty there still was even in such responsible fields of activity, frightening in their consequences, as the pedagogical, the juridical, the literary. And similar thoughts, light and diffuse, such as enter only an exhausted brain now relaxing, began drifting through Yevansky's Petrovic's head. They turn up from who knows where and why, don't say in your head for long, and seem to creep over the surface of the brain without going very far inside it, where people are obliged to think officially, in a straight line, for hours or even days on end. Such private, domestic thoughts constitute a sort of comfort, pleasant ease. It was after eight in the evening. Upstairs, beyond the ceiling, on the second floor, someone was still walking from corner to corner of the room, and higher still, on the third floor, two people were playing scales together. The person pacing, who, to judge by the nervy gait, was agonizing about something or else suffering from a toothache, and the monotonous scales imparted to the quiet of the evening something somnolent, conducive to idle thoughts. Two rooms away in the nursery, the governess and Sorozio were talking. Papa is here, the boy sang. Papa is here, 
pa, pa, pa. Voce pele vos pele, alles vite, cried the governess, squeaking like a frightened bird. I've already told you. What am I going to say to him, though? thought Yevgeny Petrovich. But before he managed to think anything up, his son Suroza, a boy of seven, was already coming into the study. This was someone whose sex could be guessed only from his clothing. He was puny, white-faced, delicate. He was limp in body like a hot house vegetable, and everything about him seemed extraordinarily gentle and soft. His movements, his curly hair, his gaze, his velvet jacket. Hello, Papa, he said in a soft voice, climbing onto his father's knees and kissing him quickly on the neck. Did you send for me? Excuse me. Excuse me, Sergei Yevgenik, replied the prosecutor, pushing him away. Before kissing, we need to have a talk. A serious one. I'm cross with you, and I don't love you anymore. I mean it, my boy. I don't love you. And you're no son of mine. No. Serioza looked at his father intently, then shifted his gaze to the desk and shrugged his shoulders. Whatever have I done to you? he asked blinking his eyes in bewilderment. I haven't been in your study once today and haven't touched anything. Natalia Semyonovna had just been complaining to me that you smoke. Is it true? Do you smoke? Yes, I've smoked once. That's right. You see, on top of that, you're lying as well, said the prosecutor, frowning and thus masking his smile. Natalia Semyonovna has seen you smoking twice. So you've been found guilty of three bad deeds. You smoke, you take somebody else's tobacco from his desk, and you lie. Thrice guilty. Oh, yes, Suryoza remembered, and his eyes smiled. That's right, that's right. I've smoked twice, today and before. There, you see? So not once, but twice. I'm very, very displeased with you. You used to be a good boy before, but now, I see, you've gone wrong and become bad. Yevgeny Petrovich adjusted Suroza's collar and thought, What else should I say to him? Yes, this is bad, he continued. I didn't expect this from you. Firstly, you have no right to take tobacco that doesn't belong to you. Everyone has the right to make use only of his own property. And if he takes somebody else's, then he's a bad person. I'm not saying the right things to him, thought Yevgeny Petrovich. For example, Natalia Semyonova has a trunk full of dresses. It's her trunk, and we, that's to say you and I, don't dare to touch it, since it's not ours. That's right, isn't it? You have your toy horses and pictures. I don't take them, do I? Maybe I'd like to take them, but they're not mine, are they? They're yours. Take them if you want said Seriosa, with raised eyebrows. Please, don't be shy, Papa, take them. This little yellow dog that's on your desk is mine, but I don't care, do I? Let it stand there. You don't understand me, said Bukowski. You gave the dog to me. It's mine now, and I can do anything I want with it. But I didn't give you any tobacco, did I? The tobacco's mine. I'm not explaining it to him right, thought the professor. This isn't right, not right at all. If I want to smoke somebody else's tobacco, first of all, I have to ask his permission. Lazily linking one phrase to another and imitating the language of a child, Bukowski began explaining to his son what property meant. Serioza gazed at his chest and listened carefully. He enjoyed conversing with his father in the evenings, then leaned his elbows on the edge of the desk and began screwing up his short-sighted eyes to look at the papers and the inkstand. His gaze roamed over the desk for a while and came to rest on a bottle of gum Arabic. Papa, what's glue made of? He asked suddenly, bringing the bottle up close to his eyes. Bukowski took the bottle from his hands, put it back in its place, and continued. Second, you smoke. That's very bad. If I smoke, it doesn't just follow that smoking's allowed. I smoke and know that it's foolish. I scold myself and don't like myself for it. I'm a cunning pedagogue, thought the prosecutor. 
Tobacco does great harm to one's health, and someone who smokes dies sooner than he should. And smoking is especially harmful for such little ones as you. You have a weak chest. You've not grown strong yet. And in weak people, tobacco smoke causes consumption and other illnesses. Uncle Ignity, he died of consumption. If he hadn't smoked, perhaps he'd have been alive to this day. Serioza gazed pensively at the lamp, touched the shade with his finger and sighed. Uncle Ignity was good at playing the violin, he said. The Gregorievs have got his violin now. Soroyza leaned his elbows on the edge of the desk again and fell into thought. An expression froze on his pale face, as though he were listening intently or else following the development of his own thoughts. Sorrow and something resembling fright appeared in his big, unblinking eyes. He was probably thinking about death now, which had so recently taken his mother and Uncle Ignati. Death carries mothers and uncles off to the other world, while their children and violins remain on earth. Dead people live in the sky, somewhere near the stars, and gaze down from there at the earth. Can they bear the separation? What shall I say to him? thought Yegengi Petrovic. He's not listening to me. He obviously doesn't consider either his misdemeanors or my arguments important. How can I make him understand? The prosecutor rose and started walking around the study. Before, in my day, these questions were decided wonderfully easily, he reflected to himself. Any young lad found guilty of smoking was flogged. The faint-hearted and cowardly did indeed give up smoking, while after a thrashing, anyone who was a little braver and cleverer began carrying his tobacco inside the top of his boot and smoking in the shed. After he'd been caught in the shed and thrashed again, he'd go off to the river to smoke, and so on, until the fellow had grown up. My mother used to bribe me not to smoke with money and sweets, but those methods seemed worthless and immoral now. Adopting a position founded on logic, the modern pedagogue tries to get a child to grasp good principles not out of fear, not from a desire to stand out or receive a reward, but with awareness. While he was walking about and thinking, Suroiza clambered up onto the chair to one side of the desk and began drawing, so that he didn't make marks on the official papers and didn't touch the ink. On the desk lay a pack of paper, specially cut into quarters for him, and a blue pencil. The cook was shredding some cabbage today and cut her finger, he said, drawing a house and moving his eyebrows up and down. She let out such a cry that we all had a real fright and ran into the kitchen. She's so silly. Natalia Semyovna tells her to dip her finger in cold water but she goes and sucks it. And how can she put a dirty finger in her mouth? It's not the done thing, Papa, is it? Then he recounted how at lunchtime an organ grinder had come into the yard with a little girl who had sung and danced to the music. He has his own train of thought, the prosecutor reflected. He has his own little world in his head, and he has his own idea of what's important and what's not. To capture his attention and awareness... It's not enough to adapt your language to match his. You have to know how to think the way he does as well. He'd have understood me very well if I'd really minded losing the tobacco. If I'd been offended and started crying, the reason why mothers are irreplaceable in their children's upbringing is that they know how to feel, how to cry, how to chuckle with them as one. You won't achieve anything with logic and moralizing. Well, what else shall I say to him? What else? And it seemed strange and ridiculous to Yagemsky Petrovic that he, an experienced jurist, who had spent half his life practicing all sorts of prevention, warning, and punishment, was quite at a loss and didn't know what to say to the boy. Listen, give me your word of honor that you won't smoke any more, he said. Word of honor, sang Zoroiza, pressing hard with the pencil and bending down toward the picture. We're out of honor. No. No. But does he know what word of honor means? Bukowski wondered. No. I'm a bad mentor. If some pedagogue or one of our court officers took a look inside my head now, they'd call me a wet rag and quite likely suspect me of trying to be too clever by far. But, you know, in school and in court, 
all these tricky questions are decided much more easily than at home. Here you're dealing with people you love madly, and love is demanding and complicates the question. If this little boy weren't my son, but my pupil or a defendant, I wouldn't be getting cold feet like this, and my thoughts wouldn't be scattered. Yevgeny Petrovich sat down at the desk and pulled one of Sergoyza's drawings toward him. The drawing was of a house with a crooked roof and smoke that zigzagged like lightning from the chimneys to the very edge of the paper. Beside the house stood a soldier with dots for eyes and a bayonet that looked like the figure four. A man can't be taller than a house, said the prosecutor. Look, your roof only comes up to the soldier's shoulder. Zerioza climbed up onto his father's knees and spent a long time shifting around to find the most comfortable way to sit. No, Papa, he said, after looking at his drawing. If you draw the soldier small, then you won't be able to see his eyes. Had he needed to challenge him? From daily observation of his son, the prosecutor was convinced that children, like savages, have their own distinctive artistic views and demands which are beyond the comprehension of adults. He found it admissible and reasonable to draw people taller than houses, and to convey with a pencil, besides objects, his sensations too. Thus, the sounds of an orchestra he depicted in the form of a spherical, smoky pots, and whistling, in the form of a spiral thread. In his conception, sound was closely contiguous to shape and color, so that every time he was coloring in letters, he invariably colored the sound L yellow, M red, A black, etc. Leaving the drawing, Serioza moved around once more, adopted a comfortable pose and busied himself with his father's beard. First he smoothed it out assiduously, then he divided it into two and began combing it back like side whiskers. Now you look like Ivan Stepanovic, he muttered, and in just a moment you'll look like our porter. Papa, why is it that porters stand at doors? To stop thieves going in? The prosecutor could feel Serioza's breath on his face. His cheek was forever touching Serioza's hair, and his soul was beginning to feel warm and soft, so soft, it was as if not just his hands, but his entire soul were lying on the velvet of Serioza's jacket. He kept glancing into the boy's big, dark eyes. It had seemed to him that gazing at him from those wide pupils were his mother, and his wife, and everything he had ever loved. And now give him a flogging, he thought, and now kindly think up a punishment. No, who on earth are we to try to become educators? People used to be straightforward. They thought lest and that's why they decided questions boldly. Whereas we think too much, we've been corroded by logic. The more developed a man is, and the more he reflects and splits hairs, the more indecisive and tentative he is, and the greater the timidity with which he sets about anything. Indeed, if you ponder on it a little more deeply, what boldness and belief in yourself you must have to undertake teaching, judging, composing a thick book. Ten o'clock struck. Well, my boy, it's time for bed, said the prosecutor. Say good night and go. No, Papa, Serioza pulled a wry face. I'll stay a bit longer. Tell me something. Tell me a story. Very well. Only after the story, to bed at once. On free evenings, Yevgeny Petrovich was in the habit of telling Serioza stories, just like the majority of businessmen and officials. He didn't know a single poem by heart, and didn't remember a single story, and so had to improvise every time. He usually began with a cliché, once upon a time in a land far, far away. Thereafter he piled up all sorts of innocent nonsense, and, as he was telling the beginning, he had absolutely no idea what the middle or the ending would be. Scenes, characters, and situations were picked at random, impromptu, and the plot and moral emerge somehow of their own accord. Independently of the storyteller's will, Serioza very much enjoyed such improvisations, and the prosecutor noticed that the more modest and unelaborate the plot turned out to be, the more powerful its impact upon the boy. Listen, he began, raising his eyes to the ceiling. Once upon a time, in a land far, far away, 
there lived an old aged Tsar with a long gray beard. And, and with his huge mustache. Well, and he lived in a glass palace, which sparkled and shone in the sun like a great big block of pure ice. And the palace, my boy, stood in an enormous garden where, do you know, there were orange trees, bergamots, cherries grew, tulips, roses, lily of the valley flowered, and many colored birds sang. Yes, on the trees they were hung little glass bells, which, when the wind blew, rang so gently you could listen to them spellbound. Glass gave you a softer and gentler sound than metal. Well, and what else? In the garden there were fountains. Remember, you saw the fountain at the Auntie Sonia's dacha? Well, fountains exactly like that stood in the Tsar's garden, only much greater in size, and the jets of water reached to the top of the tallest poplar. Yevgeny Petrovich had to think and continued. The old Tsar had only one son, their heir to the kingdom, a boy just as little as you. He was a good boy. He never had tantrums. He went to bed early. He didn't touch anything on the desk and... and... Generally good as bald, he had only one fault. He smoked. Serioza was listening hard and gazing, unblinking, into his father's eyes. The prosecutor carried on and thought, And what next? He spent a lot of time padding and spinning things out, as they say, and ended like this. Through smoking, the Serovic fell ill with consumption and died when he was twenty. The decrepit and sickly old man was left without any kind of help. There was no one to govern the state or defend the palace. Enemies came, killed the old man, destroyed the palace, and in the garden now there were no cherry trees, no birds, no little bells. And that's how it is, my boy. Such an ending seemed ridiculous and naive to Yevgeny Petrovich himself, but the whole story had made a powerful impression on Serioza. Again his eyes were clouded with sorrow and something resembling fright. He gazed pensively at the dark window for a minute, shuddered and said in a low voice, I shan't smoke any more. When he had said goodnight and gone off to bed, his father walked quietly from corner to corner of the room and smiled. People might say that it was beauty, the artistic form that made an impact here, he reflected, and that may be so, but it's no comfort, after all, that's not a genuine remedy. Why should morality and truth be presented not in raw form, but with additives, always without fail in a sugared and gilded form, like pills? It's abnormal, falsification, deception, conjuring tricks. He recalled the jurors who simply have to have a speech made to them, the public, who assimilate history only through epic legends and historical novels, himself who had derived the meaning of life not from sermons and laws, but from fables, novels, poetry. Medicine has to be sweet, the truth, beautiful, and man has affected the silliness since the time of Adam. Though, maybe it's all natural, and that's the way it should be. In nature, there are plenty of expedient deceptions, illusions. He set off to work, but for a long time idle, Domestic thoughts continued to drift through his head. Beyond the ceiling, the scales were no longer to be heard, but the second-floor resident was still pacing from corner to corner of the room. End of At Home by Anton Shekovic This is the first in the short stories that I'll be reading. This was read by me, Jordan Barclay, just doing this because I want to help y'all. If you enjoyed the production of this video, feel free to give it a like, I'd appreciate it. If you have any requests on what I what I should read next, whether it's a short story like this or one you have in particular for school or whatever, comment below and I'll see if I can get to it. And if you want to be updated on audio recordings like this, hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications. Alright guys, we got one short story down, let's get the others. Until then, I'm out. Peace.